Hi, I'm Alice. And I'm Greg. We've missed you. So we wanted to come back and give you a little update on what we've been doing. And if you want to give us an update, you can do so in the comments. We will read them and answer. It's kind of sad. It was kind of sad to just leave you so suddenly. And since we've moved here, we've had the opportunity to meet a few of you in different places. And it was very gratifying to know that some of you followed our adventures and wanted to know what we were up to now. So let's talk about why we moved back to the United States, because uh, that's a question we get asked most often is, do you miss, do you miss Mexico? And I think the answer for both of us is yes. yes. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what brought us back. So um, I, I guess it was really the impetus for moving back started with me because as somebody that has worked consistently for 30 years and part of my generational upbringing, I guess, was that I had it in my, in my thoughts that I should be a provider. I guess generationally, I was raised to think that I should bring home the bacon, so to speak. And because I wasn't doing that, there was part of me that felt like I wasn't really contributing. So I started like making noise about finding a part-time job and maybe I could do a little side hustle and make some money. And um, that opportunity came. I was able to take a part-time job. And right around that time, we realized that we weren't seeing our family as much as we wanted to see them. Yeah, I think when we first moved out, we thought, oh, it's just a three and a half hour flight. It'll be easy to come back and mm -hmm. forth. We'll be visiting Los Angeles regularly and our family and friends will visit us regularly. But it it didn't turn out that way. We mm -hmm. did have a few visitors and we did come out to Los Angeles to visit people on a few occasions but it just wasn't as frequent as we wanted. And also I think even though we talked a little bit about like bringing home the bacon and like having extra money, contributing financially, I feel that like I really want to, um, for those of you who are thinking of retiring in Mexico, I, I want to stress that we were not like, we were living on one pension, mine, because Greg is, I. I have I, I snagged a much younger man so <laughs> I didn't have a job that gave me a pension whereas Alice was a state employee and got a job that had a pension and I, and she consistently worked at that job for many years right. whereas I hopped around and you know made a, a higher income at certain points but rub it, it in but it didn't I didn't save it the way the pension works so it, there's so, so my point is that we were not this wasn't this change was not triggered because we weren't making it on one pension. In fact, we were, I feel like we lived well. We had, we didn't have a big house. We had a two bedroom apartment, which is what we have right now. And, um, and it was in a nice place. We didn't have a car, but we had great public transportation. So I feel like we lived well in Mexico and we never um, had to really do without. We did. You know, we monitored our spending as responsible adults, but uh, but this return to the United States was not due to um, an inability to pay our bills, and it wasn't due to not loving Mexico because we do. It was really it really had more to do with these opportunities lining up right. for Greg that allowed him a certain amount of work flexibility. So I had a great job opportunity that worked for me. It allowed me a lot of flexibility and a good salary, and it gave us, most importantly, the opportunity to be closer to our friends and family in Los Angeles. So that's what brought us back to Arizona. So let's talk a little bit about another exciting opportunity that came up when you were in Mexico Yeah. Um, that brought us back to the U.S., and that is as an actor. Yeah, okay, so this is an opportunity that just came out of the blue. I had been talking to Elgin James, who does a show called Mayans, and it's a On motorcycle FX. club in Southern California, and um, it's a really good series. We really enjoy watching it, but I got this call, and he asked me if I would be interested in being, uh, being in it. And of course I said, I'm not an actor, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so look for me if you, uh, if you have 
I'm not sure who carries it's it. It's on Prime. FX. Everybody FX. has FX. So okay. if you can get F- FX if you have Hulu. They rebroadcast it on Hulu. And um, they're in season five. So she's in season five. But I'm ready for my close-up. It's going to be hard. <laughs> I, I will say if you haven't been watching the show all along, it's going to be hard for you to jump in and know yeah, the Yeah, I would go back and watch all, all five seasons. <laughs> I'm near the end. And I'm sure it's, you know, it's a tiny, tiny spot in exactly... It's exactly the amount of acting that I could handle. So I think it was just a, you know, a fun size bite. Uh, <laughs> and I, I loved it. It was really good experience. I am in an all-female motorcycle club called the Broken Saints. And uh, so look for us. Broken Saints. That yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear more about that story. But right around the same time, you had an offer to come and do some shows right. on the West Coast, right? Yeah, lots. You know, it's funny because I think as soon as I moved away, I started getting more offers to play shows, and I had to turn them down. But um, I got an offer to do punk rock bowling and to open for uh, a band called The Dam that we, you know, my band is all fans of, so they wanted to do it immediately. Uh, but then I also knew that there was like, I had to fly in from Mexico and there would be rehearsals ahead of time. So it got a little complicated. Uh, so when Greg's, Greg said, I think we should move to the United States, that all made sense. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to start rehearsing with my band. We got a few other shows ahead of punk rock bowling. We played in Long Beach, at Alex's bar, and that was really fun. And we played the Ivy Room. Albany, Albany yeah. And, which, for those of you who don't know, is near Oakland. And um, and then we, this past weekend, we played punk rock bowling. So we're going to talk a little bit about punk rock bowling because this is the second time I've yeah. been with you. And um, it's a, it's a three-day fest that takes place every year over Memorial Day in Las Vegas. And it is, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger every yeah. year. Yeah, it's a festival that... Part of it is an outdoor location where there's a main stage and then there are smaller stages. Mm -hmm. But then part of it is also um, different club shows around around the city. So uh, we we played a club show. So um, just to kind of give you a basic outline of how it works. Okay, we're backstage at the festival. It's almost time for them to play. Rock and roll, motherfuckers. Yes. The other thing to know about punk rock bowling, if you're ever thinking of going, is you buy your pass and your pass gets you into the main stage festival area so you see the majority of the bands but if you want to see some of the bands that are only playing club shows you have to buy separate admission for those they're not yeah. included in the main and this could change i mean we're yeah. just telling you how it was this time around because things have evolved and changed with punk rock bowling uh, our experience this time is very different from the experience that we had mm-hmm. a few years back and uh we actually you know, I want to kick it off by saying we didn't get our wristbands. I was very disappointed that we didn't get our, our wristbands to go into the festival and uh, watch all the bands. But thank you to Disgusting, who got me in to see her band, uh, and um, also Allison Elliott, who is a fellow Broken Saint, who... Uh, is in a, in a band who, called uh, Made of Ace. Who, who is in Made of Ace, who came out uh, out of the festival, picked me up off the street, me and Greg, and slapped little artist wristbands on us, and then snuck us snuck in us past in. the guards and said we were about to play. <laughs> like, we don't have time. We gotta, they got to be on stage right now. And just ran <laughs> through. See, it we're was, still it was very sneaking into shows. So uh, that was that was the highlight of the event. That was really fun. Yeah. Their band is great. If you haven't yeah. seen them, they are wonderful. We'll we'll put a link down below in case uh, you want to check them out. In case you want to check them but out. But I, I want I do want to say something that Alice touched on is that I think I'm not a big fan of festivals like this in the first place because generally the bands have to 
have very short sets because they're accommodating and they have to move fast, right? They've got 30 bands to in one day. And so you don't really get the band warmed up. Like they hit the stage and by the time they're warmed up, they're off the stage. It's like, you know, it's like when you go to a food pop-up and you get just a sampling of yeah. like It's just you know, enough to whet your appetite. Yeah, it is really just enough to whet your appetite. And I think the bands know that. You know, I think we know like it's going to be um it's going to be not the normal uh club show that you're used to. Right. I mean, the club shows are a little bit you know, are a, a little, little bit, bit longer to, and yeah. a little bit more you, you know, they're a little more similar to a real club experience than than the festival, but um, but yeah, it's not the full Monty. <laughs> it's not even the half Monty. It's about the quarter Monty. It's about so. a quarter Monty. It's the it's the fun side, the trial <laughs> side. It's um, but it's not in my mind. It's not the ideal way to see a band. I still love seeing bands. I think some of my favorite shows are still going to. I'm right off the top of my head thinking of a basement show we went to in Chicago with Martin that was... Un- with Martin Sorondegui. With Martin yeah. Sorondegui going to see this these bands playing in a jam-packed little basement in somebody's house in Chicago, which is like, to me, the essence of punk. But it's hard to kind of capture that energy in a festival environment. Yeah. And I also want to say that I think for the bands that do this, unless you're one of the top headliner bands, if you're a support act one of the benefits of doing these shows is you get to expose yourself to a bunch of people that might not know your band that's the goal right that's the hope that you're going to broaden your audience and you're also going to be able to in theory check out other bands that you haven't seen before maybe you've heard about them or maybe you've never heard about them but you find your new favorite band and when you don't get that wristband it's a big drag because that's part of the compensation or should be part of the compensation for bands that bust their asses to do the shows yeah that's really what it's all about is for us as artists it's like having the opportunity to play for a new audience having the opportunity to see your favorite bands or or to see a band that maybe you were just curious about or you heard them while you were like sitting there you know eating a corn dog or a vegan mac and cheese you hear something that you like and you go over to the stage and you discover a new band that you love that's the beauty of the festival Right? Plus the sunburn, which is <laughs> also fun. Yeah. We eventually made it on stage at the Fremont Country Club, and even though our set was cut short by the powers that be, we made the best of it and still managed to have fun. While we were in Las Vegas, we took the opportunity to visit the Punk Rock Museum, Alice was invited to come sneak in again. And no, we, well, <laughs> we actually, in a way, yes, we did. They, they brought us in through the side entrance. I don't know why, but, we, but instead of through the front. Actually, the person who brought us in said she brought us in to the, through the back because she wanted to surprise me oh. as we went in. To the main entrance. To the main entrance. And it did surprise me, actually, because when you walk in, as you're, you go in to buy your ticket, and as you're walking through the door, the first picture you see is me. <laughs> and that was kind of shocking. Yeah. Of course, I was immediately like, you know, flattered and honored. It's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of wild being in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> And then I walked in and I saw the other people that were on the wall and I was just so humbled to be sharing that space Mm -hmm. with people who I think are very talented and who really helped create a movement that changed my life. So walking through the Punk Rock Museum, I noticed that there was a deliberate attempt to be inclusive and I appreciate that. Uh, Was it completely inclusive? Maybe not. I think there are places where there could be improvement, but this museum has been open less than two months. So I think if you consider that, I want to like give them that, you know, I want to give them kudos for doing a really good job and, you know, keeping women, people of color, um, 
trans, trans and queer folk at the front. Uh, and I just, I just feel like they, they are mindful of what they're doing. They are talking to a bunch of different people about how they can improve um, the experience there. I think this museum is only going to get better and stronger. I think it would benefit from your input if you go leave a comments or maybe maybe if they have comments or um, recommendations, you could say like, I want to see this or you're missing this part. There's a whole uh, second floor where it looks like they might have um, additional space. Additional I think, space. Expand, right? I, I personally would love to see more um, international punk. Um, there, are, there are bands. I know there were people that we felt like, oh, I wish they'd included this. And if you go and you're from a different place, you might say like, oh, they should have had, you know, this band mm -hmm. that we love. Um, that's going to happen. You know, no matter where you're from, you're going to you're going to walk in and you're going to wish that they had included something else that's not there. But I think if we look at it for what it is, um, which is uh, a museum that's uh, created by people who were involved in the scene and they have their own perspective, but they're also mindful of trying to be inclusive. I am grateful for that. And as I always say, when somebody does something good, documenting their own scene is if you feel like this place is lacking, then make your own place i'm all for that different people having their own museum that highlights the community you want to see highlighted I highlights think. the community you want to see highlighted and documents your own experience mm -hmm. yeah i think it's as alice said it's 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 a super ambitious project it is it's very impressive the collection you will walk in and you'll be impressed by some artifact or and just the volume of artifacts and the quality that they have it is not all inclusive. I think that they would love to be over time. But I think anytime I see any discussion around punk rock online, it's always like, what about this band? Or did you know about this band? Or no, that's not the way it happened. It was this other band that was more important. So there's always this kind of punk infighting. And I want to resist the impulse to kind of yeah. point out the flaws because it it's not 100% it's not inclusive yet but there is obviously an intent to do so and i think they're asking they're starting to ask the right people who they should have in the museum yeah yeah so, so. go and let us know what you think and uh, and more importantly let the museum people know what you think and if there is an omission and they get enough mm -hmm. people saying hey you need to include martin crudo here and enough people say it um <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, yes yeah. i know we were so yeah i got i know i, I guess I but you know what I, as i said everybody's gonna have someone they feel like should be but in there. there but martin should be in there i am sorry <laughs> that's like that's one that's like okay but um uh, but we'll move on we we <laughs> overall i think we really had fun at the museum yeah. it was much bigger more comprehensive and more inclusive than i even expect it mm -hmm. uh so i'm I want, i'm gonna give it a thumbs up i say go see it judge for yourself give some feedback and uh if you're unhappy definitely say i'm unhappy with this this should be in there because people won't change unless you tell them i before we completely wrap up and finish talking about the punk rock museum i i still have very personally i've i'm conflicted about the idea of punk rock in a museum because for me punk rock is still a living breathing movement and i i know that when i go see bands like the groans play that that is the essence of punk to me mm, that yeah. they're like that is as punk as you can get for me and i know that that's not for everyone but i i still feel a little like how can you write the story of punk rock when it's still being written how can you tell the story or you can tell it in the aspect of like these are the origins and this is how it developed but it's well i think one of the good things about the museum is they actually have it divided up by like there's a kind of a timeline right. and you know it tells you what city they are focusing on I, which seems to help i still to, think i just think one of the problems with punk happened when people started to categorize different types of things and say this is punk or this is hardcore or this is death rock or this is rockabilly or this is instead of or new wave new wave and originally it was just this very vibrant 
mix of everything and a celebration of something that was new, right? Yeah. And it wasn't really, it was defying categorization. And I think once you start categorizing and labeling, it somehow lessens the impact of it for me. Well, I'm going to disagree with you, Greg. I think that this uh, punk rock museum is an extension of like the whole DIY culture. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's the same as like writing your own zine, except you are actually now we're older. We have uh, a lot of memorabilia <laughs> and we have, you know, some people have the means to actually house it mm -hmm. and, and show the children <laughs> that show there the were <laughs> show the children that there were but the you know, children early. are still creating their own punk definitely rock. That's the my children point. are still like, creating but just like when you go to an art museum yeah. that doesn't mean that if you you know if you like a particular art if you're willing to go back to michelangelo or you're looking at picasso that you mean, don't yeah, know you that don't there is not it. like you know a, a current artist you know that you want to see frank the cobbler or uh, <laughs> Frank the, the cardboard cobbler. Frank the cardboard cobbler, or uh, or Seth doing his like ceramic yeah. work. Mm -hmm. or, you know, like all the all the it. artists or Shizu. Or, I get it. It's a continuum. Yeah. But it's it's still it's a little weird to me to walk into a museum. It's just me. That's my personal opinion. So it was very cool. I don't want to take that away from it. It's it's a pretty awesome collection. So. I think that's it for us right now. We want to keep it short and sweet, just mm -hmm. let you know what we've been up to. And if you want to share anything with us, we'd love to hear what you're up to. Mm -hmm. um, we are going back to Mexico yeah. in June just to pick up some stuff we left behind, to say hi to the people that we miss so much. And uh, we'll be there very briefly. And then we're coming back and more exciting things, which uh, maybe we'll give you another update in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows yeah. What's the, what the future holds for us. Yeah. So it's a very exciting time for us. Thanks for watching. Let us know how you're doing, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. So, it, believe it or not, it's 11 o'clock at night.